Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Johan Fleck. I'm the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Europe Center, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the special AC front page, our premier platform at the, at the Atlantic Council for the world's foremost leaders. A heartfelt thank you to Georgetown University School of Foreign Service for hosting us. Um, today we're honored to welcome the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte. A founding member of NATO and an early shaper of the European project, the Netherlands have for decades played a critical role in Europe and the transatlantic partnership. Today, that legacy is carried forward by Prime Minister Rutte, who embodies the commitment to the transatlantic relationship that the Council, the Atlantic Council, was established to promote over 70 years ago. For his steadfast leadership, we presented the Prime Minister with the Atlantic Council's 2019 Global Citizen Award. It's, it's great to have Prime Minister Ruta back at an Atlantic Council event. His visit falls under the long shadow of Russia's war in Ukraine. When Vladimir Putin ordered Russian troops into Ukraine in February of last year, he made two bad bets. First, that Ukraine would quickly falter, and second, that a fractured and weak West would stand idly by. He lost badly on both. For nearly a year, the Ukrainian people have shown incredible courage and tenacity in fighting back against, their, against Russian attacks on their lives, their homes, and the hospital, hospitals. Ukraine stepped up, and so has the West, supplying Kyiv with military, humanitarian, and financial aid, implementing historic sanctions against the Kremlin's war machine, and re recommitting to our collective defense through NATO. As one of the longest serving statesmen in Europe, Prime Minister Rutte understands what's at stake and why we must not leave Ukraine in a gray zone, in its territorial integrity, its self-determination, and its Euro-Atlantic future. The Prime Minister has quite a full agenda for his visit, and so we're especially grateful for him making time to, to join us here at Georgetown and at the Atlantic Council to share his perspectives on how we continue to make that bet against our democratic ideals a bad and costly one. To our virtual audience, make sure you follow us along using the hashtag AC Front page. A warm welcome to the Prime Minister again. And let me hand over to our gracious host and the Dean of Georgetown School of Foreign Service, Joel Hellman. Thank you. I'll be very quick because we want to get straight to the program. But first, let me welcome. We have a wonderful group of ambassadors here who've joined us, and we want to appreciate that, especially Madam Ambassador from the Ukraine, um, from the Netherlands. We're very appreciative of your, your presence here today. Um, I just want to spend also a word of welcome to the students who are here and a recognition um, of Prime Minister Rutte's commitment to deepen the engagement on the transatlantic alliance by ensuring that in an extraordinarily busy visit here to the United States where he's met with the president, um, where he's been on Capitol Hill, where he's interviewed with CNN, he's taken the time from his busy schedule to speak to the next generation of leaders that we train here at Georgetown at the School of Foreign Service. It says something about his commitment to the future of transatlantic relationships, and we deeply appreciate his willingness um, to do so. We look forward to the conversation today. Let me say that the minister, um, uh, Prime Minister, will be interviewed by Amy McKinnon. She is an award-winning national security and intelligence reporter at Foreign Policy Magazine. They will have an interaction for about a half hour, and they will open it up to questions from you, the audience. We look forward to the conversation, and we welcome you. Let me bring to the stage Prime Minister Ruta and Amy McGinnon. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Dean Hellman and Jorn. It is my pleasure to be 
hosting the conversation today with the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte. And before I begin, I would like to thank our audience for joining us in person today. It's so wonderful to see rooms full of people again after so many years of the pandemic. Um, I'm Amy McKinnon. I'm a national security reporter with Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, the Prime Minister is in Washington for a very flying visit before he heads off to Davos, uh, where he also has an equally packed schedule. Um, so we're very lucky to have a slice of his time today. We will be taking questions from the audience at around the half hour mark. Um, there's two microphones down the front here, um, so you'll have your chance to put your own questions to the Prime Minister. So next month, Prime Minister, marks the one year anniversary of the Russian yeah. invasion of Ukraine. It's incredible how, how quickly this somber Absolutely. anniversary has come round. Officials in Kiev have been sounding the alarm that Moscow may be on the brink of announcing another mobilization ahead of a renewed offensive operation in the spring. Do you think we have reached an inflection point in the war in terms of ensuring that Ukraine has the military equipment that it needs to repel and respond to a renewed Russian assault? Uh, well, I, I, I would argue that we are doing a lot, but exactly for the reason you mentioned, that there is this risk that uh, in six weeks or two months' time. I was on the phone with uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, on Monday, and, and this is also in all the open sources, so I can speak about it, that there is this worry that in six months, six weeks to two months' time, Russia might again uh, organize a big attack mm -hmm. on uh, Ukraine, given that fact we, we probably have to do more at the moment. That's why we are now participating in this Patriot mission uh, the Germany and the US had, uh, brought together. Um, but at the same time, I'm impressed by what the world has been doing so far, and particularly the US. Uh, without the leadership of the US, um, uh, and I, I think history will judge this, uh, uh, over time, uh, Ukraine would not be where it is today, uh, which is, since summer, basically rolling back the Russians. Now it is more level headed, but at least between August and November, Ukraine was really able to roll back uh, the Russian aggression. And, but I'm really worried about the next, uh, let's mm. say, two to three months. And everything we can do now to even do more with Ukraine, help them, is crucial. I mean, something that we hear a lot from the Ukrainians is, you know, they're incredibly grateful for the support they're being given from their Western partners, but that the support, the current levels of support are enough to to kind of sustain their effort, yeah. but not enough yet to win the war, that it's just going to kind of prolong the bloodshed. What more do you think needs to be done to actually tip the balance in favor so Ukraine can actually win the conflict? Well, of course, the debate now is on these Patriot systems. So luckily, mm -hmm. they are now being shipped uh, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, the other big issue, of course, will be out, uh, around tanks. Mm -hmm. But that is very sensitive politically in many countries. So we have to take that decision uh, step by step. It cannot just be one country doing it. It always has to be a coalition. Um, uh, and I think that will help a lot. It is also about maintenance and repair, uh, because a lot of these systems are now in Ukraine. They are being worn out by the war effort. Uh, so a lot of uh, effort is now put into uh, making sure that we repair, for example, the, the Panzerhauwitzer systems, the Germans and we uh, shipped to uh, Ukraine in May and June. Um, well, they are now at a stage, of course, uh, some of these systems that they need to be repaired. So this is also a shift in, in what we need to do. Uh, of course, the Americans, together with Germans and others, are training Ukrainians mm -hmm. here, but also in, in Germany, uh, which is very helpful to, to teach them. These people are incredibly brave, incredibly focused. Um, and you have to realize that people have families across the border. Uh, of course, these are two different countries, but there are so many family ties between Ukrainians and Russians. And, and now, all of a sudden, uh, because of this Russian attack, they are enemies. Um, but I'm, I've been so impressed from the end of January, when I visited Kiev before the war started, speaking to um, uh, senior citizens, to uh, people who were out of the military, people in the military, all saying, this is not going to happen again. We, we did not fight Crimea, but if Putin is doing this, he will have a fight on his hands he has not seen before. And that's exactly what happened. So, uh, but also then to help them to, be, to strategize on how to um, uh, take that war effort in a more effective way. Also in the theater itself, the, the, the actual places where the war is taking place and the training taking place is crucial.
You announced at your meeting with President Biden earlier today, as you've already mentioned, that you're going to join with the US and German decision to send yeah. Patriot missile batteries to Ukraine, um, the hope being that this will will help with this incredible air assault that they're coming under from the Russians. Are you able to share any details? About, you know, what prompted this decision by the Netherlands now? Yes, well, we have tried from the start to nudge others to do more. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not the biggest country in Europe. We are the fifth economy in the EU. Uh, but of course, France and Germany are much bigger. And of, out of the 27, we are five on the list, but again, uh, much smaller than the, the, the two big ones and Italy. Um, despite that fact, we have tried from the start to do whatever we could. And that was also nudging others to do more if, if possible, like with these uh, uh, Howitzer uh, systems. Because I felt, uh, we felt as a government, uh, the defense minister, foreign minister, myself and the military guys and military men and women in the Netherlands, that we had to really invest in this. And um, uh, that means that we are at the moment, uh, when you look at what we spend compared to uh, our GDP, uh, mm -hmm. let's say per capita, we are really at, at, at the high end with the Americans, with the Brits, and we um, announced again that we will spend two and a half billion this year on supporting the Ukraine war effort. If we had the skill of the US, that would be an extra hundred billion. Uh, on our scale, it is two and a half billion, but it's still a lot of money. Um, but of course, we all have to do more, um, and, as, and the same goes for us. So one of the things that Ukraine has been asking for a long time now is tanks, and in particular, these German-made Leopard 2 tanks. I understand that the Netherlands is one of, I think, a dozen-plus European countries that has Leopard 2 tanks in its stockpiles. Is this something that you would consider if Berlin gave you the green light? Would you be willing to, to send some of your Leopards to Ukraine? I completely understand the question. It's true that we are, well, more or less on a sort of lease construction. We are using these tanks. We could buy them. We could send them to Ukraine. But it will be difficult for me to answer that question directly. And the reason is that this is all very sensitive. Mm. Uh, and what uh, I found out, uh, my experience in the last 10 months, is that you are the most effective when you only talk about things which have been, real, have been realized, so when the decisions have been taken. Mm -hmm. And when colleagues feel pressured by what you are saying to the press before the decisions have been taken, it's not helpful to get to the right decisions. It's good for my ego, but it doesn't help. So uh, I don't do that because my priority now is that Ukraine gets what it needs. So yeah. I'm a bit, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not completely open about this, this, this tank issue, uh, but obviously many countries are discussing what can be done in what yeah. type of format. Can you give us a flavor of what that looks like behind the scenes when you're discussing with allies decisions of what to send to Ukraine, when, how to deal with repairs? I mean, just give us a sense yeah. of the complexities that are involved in that. Yeah, most of the debate is taking place at the senior military level. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the uh, let's say, the commanders of the uh, various uh, military systems in Europe, US, Canada. Um, at the same time, of course, a lot of those debates also take place at the level of the foreign minister, defense ministers, and sometimes at the leaders' level, uh, there is a direct uh, contact. Um, and for example, Germany, what they did uh, that first weekend after uh, Ukraine was invaded by Russia, uh, pledging another 100 billion uh, on defense spending, bringing them in one step, in one go, to the 2%. Uh, um, Welsh pledge, where we, we pledged in NATO in 2014 that we would spend 2% of our GDP on defence. We followed, so we have also now decided to spend another 5 billion, which also brings us uh, to the 2% in 2024, from 2024 onwards. Um, so what Germany did was huge. Uh, those decisions then, of course, take others along. Uh, they uh, set the tone. And sometimes it is me nudging another. Uh, colleague to do more and sometimes another colleague is nudging me to do more. Mm -hmm. But we are constantly dialoguing what can we do and where are the red lines so we will not have NATO boots on the ground. Of course there's a very sensitive issue of fighter jets yeah. uh, and tanks is, is of course a sort of a separate uh, area which we are dialoguing now about uh, within NATO, what we can do. And so just staying on the question of, of military aid, for, for, for one more question, at least, at least for me. Um, there's going to be another meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group yeah. of NATO Defense on Ministers on Friday, yes. Yeah. What are your hopes that will come out of this meeting? Well, it, first of all, let me say that it is incredibly helpful that Zelensky and uh, President Zelensky and his team are always very clear what they need. Mm. So when I'm on the phone with him, I have always, well, I, I, I take note 
of what he is ordering. And, and then we look what we can do. <laughs> and sometimes we can't, but we can buy it elsewhere. We can still ship it uh, to Ukraine. And sometimes we can't and we can ask others, could you please fill that gap? Uh, but the fact that the Ukrainians are extremely uh, clear uh, on what they need is helpful. And also on Friday again in this in this format where uh, all these uh, senior people will meet on, on what we collectively can do, uh, this will be the case. And, and you've seen the impressive decision the Brits took uh, mm -hmm. a couple of days ago, which is also an um, uh, incredible amount of gear they are going to ship to Ukraine. Of course, the US deciding on 40 billion extra on uh, helping with uh, defense shipments. Uh, we are all doing our part, but that will be on Friday. So it is not one big decision. Mm -hmm. uh, it will also be a, a whole add-up of smaller decisions collectively, making sure that Ukraine needs, gets what it needs. Not to press you, but I will. Uh, do you think we will see a decision from Germany on the Leopard tanks? Well, it is not, not just Germany. So, mm -hmm. uh, of course, Germany is producing the Leopard uh, 2 tanks, but a decision like this has to be broader based. And again, there are many pluses and minuses, so it is not... Uh, that easy to predict what will happen, uh, but to ask from Kiev is completely clear. Right, yes. Um, what do you make of the incredible changes that we have seen in Europe and particularly within NATO over the past, over the past 12 months? It has been incredible. Mm. And um, well, the first question I think for me is, what is, why are we doing this? Why are we reacting to the Russian aggression as we are? And for me, the answer is, is, has two sides. One is, what Putin is doing is directly running against our values, what we stand for, and it is that you do not colonize another country, mm -hmm. um, that you do not force uh, to grab other, another country's uh, um, uh, area, um, land, uh, that you do not use force, that democracy, uh, freedom of speech, uh, uh, freedom of journalism, so that, that you are able to, uh, to express yourself, that these are all sacrosanct in, in the Western world. So I think one reason why we are so much united is that we, we are just absolutely not accepting this at the value level. But there is also another side to this coin, and that has to do with collective security. If we would accept, if we would accept for one moment that Putin could be successful in Ukraine, that he would get Kiev, that he would get the whole country, it won't end there. Mm -hmm. He will continue. History has taught us this lesson. I'm not going to say there are, there are analogies between him and Hitler, some are saying, but there is one analogy. And the analogy is with Munich 38. Mm -hmm. When Chamberlain came back and said, I bring you peace in our time, and Churchill saying, Britain had to choose between war and his honor. Britain chose this honor, it will get war. And, and, and for me, that analogy is absolutely there. So, um, and that has to do with Western Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe, first of all, but also Western Europe. It also has to do with the United States. My debates with Trump on why NATO was necessary uh, were always along these lines, that it's not just the US participating in NATO, because this is something history brought us together in the Second World War, and this was the next step. No, if Russia would be able to get a control, a grip, a Finlandization of large parts of Europe, that would immediately impact the collective security and safety of the United States, it will be the springboard uh, for Russia to get here. And we have seen the same at a smaller scale in the Second World War, uh, where Hitler used uh, Europe uh, as a springboard to the UK. So uh, there is a direct vital security interest for the US to be in, of course, next to all the values we uh, hold in common. In a tweet over the weekend, you said that the Russian strike on an apartment block in Dnipro underscores why Russia cannot be allowed to win this war. Um, you know, expanding on that, assuming that Russia does not win this war, in your conversations both within your own government and with allies, are you doing any contingency planning for what Russia might like once this war is over? I mean, I can see a range of scenarios that could play out, you know, all of which have got pretty profound policy implications for both Europe and NATO. Yes, it, it, of course, there are, there are so many uh, possible outcomes that it's very difficult to, for each of them, have a mm. complete uh, strategy on the table, of course, but we are, of course, dialoguing about it and strategizing. Uh, first of all, the question will be who can decide to uh, enter into peace talks? And there's only one person who can decide that, uh, together with his government, and that's the president of Ukraine. And of course, the Ukrainian government, Ukrainian people. Uh, let's assume for a second that Texas was under attack or the state of Washington was under attack, and I would call uh, President Biden and say, hey, Joe, Mark on the phone. 
uh, don't be uh, such a difficult person, start negotiating with the Canadians or the Mexicans. Uh, <laughs> you would not accept it. And I, or hypothetically. So, <laughs> but here's the same. Uh, when we would ask uh, of uh, Zelensky, hey, uh, this is not helpful, etc., and, and why are you such a difficult person, uh, call uh, Vladimir and, 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 and arrange something, it's unacceptable. He will never accept it. So it is only Zelensky and his team who can decide uh, when they will uh, uh, engage in peace talks. And we know from some Turkish initiatives in March, at the start of the war, and some other initiatives that there are various plans on the table. At the end, it is for him to decide on mm -hmm. what type of scenario we will have. Of course, Russia will not go away. Russia is there, it will be part, large part of Europe and also of Asia. Uh, is, is the biggest country in the world, 140 million people. The economy combined is not that huge. It is, it is the added sum of Belgium and the Netherlands, the overall size of the economy. It's the 11th economy in the world, so it's not huge, but they spend a lot of their money, of course, on, uh, on military uh, uh, spending. Um, and um, um, uh, so it is there. And, and of course, if there would be a peace talk and it would be successful, you would have to somehow recreate that relationship with Russia. Mm -hmm. But there will be one other issue which has to do with accountability. Uh, I'm coming from The Hague and The Hague is the international city for peace and justice. Um, I, I could not accept uh, that we would let this go by unpunished. Uh, so accountability. Uh, we are working with the uh, Ukrainians and others to set up an aggression tribunal, preferably in The Hague. We are doing other stuff to make sure that uh, accountability, uh, that uh, we will hold them accountable, that that is be, being taken care of. That also has to be part of this. So you have the peace talks, hopefully one day, uh, the, the Ukrainians deciding when, you will have this debate on the future relationship between the West and mm -hmm. Russia, but you always will also have the accountability issue to be taken care of, because uh, we cannot, as a Western world, accept as a civilized part of, of the world community, together with all our partners in the Global South and in Asia, that this would go by unchallenged, unpunished. I'm glad you brought up the question of accountability. Um, you know, the Netherlands, as you know, has hosted a number of international tribunals. I mean, what are some of the lessons learned from this experience that you think need to be taken into account when considering a tribunal for Ukraine? Well, the first is the tenacity uh, that you should not let go. Uh, and it takes time. Uh, of course, we had this terrible experience in 2014 on the 17th of July with the downing of flight, flight MH17, which was a, a flight uh, from Malaysian Airlines, uh, which was downed uh, above um, the Donbass region in Ukraine. And it has all been looked into, and it was a Russian buck rocket system which took this plane out of the air. And it has taken us years to get to a court, then to a court case, then to uh, a decision by the court. And we have seen from Lockerbie and other cases in history that it can take years and years and years before you get to full recognition. But we will not let go. The Netherlands and others, uh, our partners on this, will not let go. Um, the same goes for when you set up these type of tribunals. You need to, to take the long view because it will not immediately take the Yugoslav case, uh, the Yugoslav tri Tribunal in The Hague, it has taken years before you get people there, before you can really prosecute and then come to conclusions by the judges on what needs to be done next. And, um, but it, it's, it's um, only decent to do that. It is the decent way to go forward. So, as promised, I'm now going to put you to the mercy of the Georgetown University students. This um, was the easy part. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, if you have a question for the Prime Minister, uh, there's a microphone down the front here and <coughs> down the front here as well. If you could make your way to the mic, I'll take one from each side. Um, if you could just begin by quickly identifying yourself, your name and your affiliation. And if you are a student here at Georgetown, please do let us know what you're studying. And, and who are the Dutch students? Are you sitting? Yeah, ah, great. <laughs> I heard there was a whole bunch. Fantastic. So, sir, please. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister, for speaking with us. Uh, my question to you is, sorry, my name is Mac, and I'm a first year grad student at uh, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. I'm doing communication, culture, and technology. Great. So my question to you is, how does the Netherlands and its allies plan to address the challenges posed by Russia's use of hybrid warfare tactics, such as disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks? Yeah. 
Well, Matt, that, that is an excellent question. And this is something, of course, we have been working on for many years and, and still are, are trying to get ahead of, of the curve. And, uh, it, and this is not just because of this terrible Russian aggression against Ukraine, but this is taking something we have to discuss, uh, we are discussing for a longer time. And here, I think the answer is that you have to cobble together many small initiatives. You need to have your business community uh, on board and to be sensitive to this. You need to have the best scholars and thinkers. You have to organize it at the national level, but also make sure that uh, it's something you address at the uh, at NATO uh, at NATO level, because there's also a capability issue. Um, and um, uh, when you think about it, the impact somebody could have through cyber attacks, also on your physical infrastructure, uh, you, you really get very worried when you think about the possibilities. Uh, so you have to make sure that all these safety systems are in place. You can not, never be 100% sure, it has to be zero tolerance, uh, but you cannot uh, guarantee zero cases. Of course, you are aiming for that, but there's no absolute guarantee. But it is adding together all these initiatives, and uh, we are working on this with all our colleagues, um, because this is of course, the next step, uh, uh, the next phase. And, and at the same time, this Russian aggression against Ukraine is incredibly old-fashioned in a sense that it is a, a war with rockets and soldiers, etc., uh, which you were not, not expecting to take place at this level, at this scale in Europe. Thank okay. you. Thank you Very so much, question. Prime Minister. It was an excellent question. Um, I'll now go to this side of the room, please. Hello, I'm Andrew. Um, I study international political economy here at Georgetown. And my question is about Belarus. Um, certainly, Belarus has been in the news about the tribunals against, uh, I guess you would say, um, the democratic government in exile, and also its support in Ukraine. So I was wondering, um, well, what is the West, and especially the Netherlands, planning to address uh, the democratic needs in Belarus? Yes, of course, we, we work closely with the opposition leader, and, and he is in jail, as you know, but his wife is uh, living in, uh, in Lithuania, and she is formidable uh, and taking care of, basically for her husband, uh, trying to be the voice of, of the liberal opposition uh, and basically the liberal uh, government, but then in exile, because she, she is representing, I believe, the legitimate government of Belarus, but okay, she's not able to to um, uh, uh, get to the power base itself in Minsk. So we, we are trying to put as much pressure on Belarus as possible, also through many sanction packages, but it is not easy. And, and Belarus more and more, of course, is a vassal state of Russia. It's very difficult to look at them as a separate state, uh, but they are very much under uh, Russian uh, control. So the big question is whether the guy in Minsk is, uh, without, of course, having a huge ego, whether he is still really in control of anything. Um, but we have to maintain um, that, um, that fallacy and then try to still put pressure on him. And just to piggyback on that, I mean, how concerned are you about the exercises beginning today between the Belarusians and, and the Russians? Yeah, obviously we are following every, uh, uh, every situation. So it could be genuine exercise, it could also be the sort of precursor to something bigger. Um, mm -hmm. Also here, intelligence is crucial. Um, uh, um, I cannot tell you what I know or do not know. Uh, the, Go the good stuff, by the way, is that the Americans, starting in December, have opened up on intelligence, basically uh, sent it to the international press. And then people were thinking, yes, they did the same as Iraq. Is this true? Well, it was all true. Mm -hmm. And it was all uh, exactly according to what they brought out. But too many people, I think, still were thinking about Iraq and therefore thinking they're overstating it. But it was not overstated. It was just uh, presenting the material as it was there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, next, please. Um, hello, Prime Minister Rutte. Thank you very much for being with us uh, today here. My name is Juan Solano. I'm an international student from Colombia, uh, currently in his second year of the Security Studies program uh, here at Watch, uh, Georgetown from University. Yes. Great. Um, so I have two questions. Both of them have to do with the same topic. I'll drift away a little bit, of, you know, from Ukraine. Um, with the wave of slavery reparations and republicanization that the Caribbean is undergoing, what is your opinion uh, of the political future of the Dutch Caribbean, Saba, Santa Stasius, and Martin, mm -hmm. Bonaire, Aruba, St. Martin, and Curaçao within the kingdom itself? That on one side. Uh, and on the other one, um, both Colombia and the Netherlands, due to the 
bicontinentality, I guess, of the Netherlands share this problem of the Venezuelan refugee crisis. Um, and the ABC Islands, if I'm not mistaken, is home at the moment to a little bit less than 50,000 mm -hmm. Venezuelan refugees. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us about how the kingdom has been dealing uh, with this out of proportion crisis yeah. and what will the future of these people look like within the boundaries of the European Union? Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, maybe to explain, so the, the, the Netherlands is a country in Europe, but the king of the Netherlands, it consists of three other countries, so the Netherlands in Europe, but also Curaçao, Aruba and St. Martin in the Caribbean. And then there are three smaller islands, well smaller, they, they have fewer inhabitants, they are not necessarily smaller, uh, Saba, Stacia uh, and Bonaire, who are um, basically, um, well, like local municipalities. Uh, uh, of course, each of these islands has full uh, power to uh, decide to leave the kingdom. Uh, uh, they are not colonized, they are, they are independent. Uh, but we work together uh, within this construction of the kingdom. And this is history. History brought us together. Uh, we try to be a gateway for them, for their products to Europe to help them uh, and of course uh, this uh, unique historical situation also provides the Netherlands with a unique gateway into Middle America and Latin America uh, and we try to make the most of it uh, and, 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 and we are great friends uh, and sometimes we are fighting each other a bit uh, but generally it's, it's working out uh, very well. Um, on slavery, I uh, apologized uh, for, to all these um, people who were enslaved and also their descendants till now for what the Dutch did in this through the West Indian Company, uh, shipping uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, over a couple of centuries from Africa uh, to uh, the Caribbean, uh, to Suriname and other parts of the Americas. Um, and uh, I think we were one of the first doing this. I'm not exactly sure whether others have done it before. Uh, and as I said in my speech, it is a comma, not a dot. So this is only the start of a dialogue, which is not just saying sorry and now we continue. No, it is, uh, it is really taking time, reflecting. And uh, on the 1st of July, which will be an important um, uh, uh, commemoration day in, in, uh, in large parts of the kingdom and also in Suriname, we will come back to this and this will be a whole host of activities. Um, uh, you're right, Venezuela, of course, I, I sometimes say it is not, not Germany which is our biggest neighbor, it is Venezuela. Uh, and by the way, Colombia is also a big one, uh, but of course I'm, I'm happy to meet uh, the new Colombian president uh, in, uh, in Davos uh, tomorrow or Thursday, I think it is, we have an appointment. Uh, and I'm really impressed by what he is doing and how he's trying to reinvigorate the peace process within Colombia. And with Venezuela, it's much more difficult uh, because there are sometimes signs that the country is trying to move ahead. Uh, but it is all very early stage and at the moment it is still a dictatorship suppressing its people. And that means that we feel obliged to help the countries who are closest to Venezuela, so Curaçao, Aruba, and also this municipality of Bonaire, in, in how to handle this and, and, to, and somehow to incorporate uh, the Venezuelans and their societies. But it's not easy because the, this is not the richest part of the world. Uh, at the same time, uh, after Corona and Covid, it is taking up again. So luckily tourism is getting back and that means that many people need to get employment, uh, need to be found for all the vacancies, but it's not easy. And, and it, it, is, it is step by step trying to help each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and back over to this side, please. Thank you so much. And Prime Minister, thank you so much for being here. It's a privilege and an honor. My name is Andrea Pozderac, and I'm also an international student from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Ah. <laughs> so uh, I'm currently my second year of my master's program in German and European studies here at Georgetown. And which, which city did you come from in Bosnia? Sarajevo. Right. Um, my question will be related to the International Criminal Tribunal. Um, looking back on the Yugoslavia case, we can see that a lot of former convicted war criminals are now free and um, want, like, not only getting elected for public office, but receiving public praise. So my question is whether the ICTY actually is, did manage to deliver justice, and two, whether that can be avoided um, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, in a sense that convicted war criminals remain convicted war criminals. Yeah. Well, of course, this is sometimes a frustrating part and it will never be perfect because you need so many people to help. Uh, I do think that the Yugoslav Tribunal was able uh, to at least get some of the key players uh, in front of the judges and also to uh, then uh, give a verdict on what they did, including the sentencing which followed, but not on everyone. 
Uh, and I know there is a lot of frustration in the region that it has not been entirely successful. Uh, I, I think that's bound to, to be with many of these cases. It will ne never be perfect, but you have to aim for perfection, of course. But you need to have so many uh, players to work along and, and to do what is necessary, and particularly in the region. And when you go back to this awful, and it was till the Russian aggression against Ukraine, it was the biggest uh, past Second World War event in Europe, uh, with so many people dying and so many atrocities, which was the Yugoslav war uh, taking place between roughly 94 and 97. And, and, and even after that, uh, 99. So, um, uh, but but I, I would love to discuss this further because uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, it, it's not perfect. I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. But we have to keep aiming for, for getting them there and to show all reasonable people in the world that you can simply not do stuff like this and that you then will be prosecuted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Please, your question, sir. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. My name is Brian. I'm an international student from Taiwan, and I'm currently a junior majoring in international economics here at the School of Foreign Service. So my question has to shift a little bit from Moscow to China, as it is the country that has the potential to launch another full-scale military assault on a neighboring country. Hence, it is fundamental that we ensure China does not develop or have access to certain high-end technology, most notably, advanced semiconductor chips yeah. that are smaller than 10 nanometers, used to empower missiles, rockets, drones, and et cetera. So to that end, the US government and your government and ASML, the world's largest semiconductor um, uh, equipment company, does not export the latest EUVs to China, which is um, made um, for missiles and rockets. However, the latest news is that last year, SMIC, China's largest semiconductor manufacturing company, was able to produce seven nanometer chips by merely using DUVs, which was the earlier generations of EUVs also provided by ASML. Hence, my question is that, is your government considering also adding ASML's DUVs to China's export control list? Thank you. This type of discussion, but not only about China, but generally, how you make sure that high-end technology is not being used for defense purposes or that you would, as a Western community, uh, Europe, America, would, would uh, lose out on our, uh, uh, on our capability uh, to move to the, to the next phase on this, and that others are not uh, taking over. And at the same time, we have to make sure that the supply chain keeps on running, because many of these uh, uh, semicon products are used in refrigerators and cars, and they are low-end, so you, you still need that mass production of, of, of semiconductors, let's say, at, at, at a more basic level. Uh, so all of this is being discussed um, with many of our partners. The Netherlands is uh, one of the uh, leading countries uh, on this, but of course uh, other parts of the world are as well. In Taiwan you have many high-end companies, uh, in countries like Korea, Japan, uh, but also in Europe and other countries like Germany. So we are discussing with many partners how to make sure that on the one hand you do not disrupt the, uh, the supply chain, but on the other hand you prevent uh, losing this leading edge technology and at the same and, and, and also being at the forefront and this usage in, in defense uh, equipment. But that is, a, that is not aimed at one country. Uh, that has to be broader based because otherwise we are just pinpointing it to one country, but that would be silly. It has to be broader based and that's the debate we are having. So I was today in the White House, we discussed of course Ukraine. Uh, uh, at a uh, very, uh, very lengthy and, and a crucial discussion, very good talk on this. Uh, but we also discussed this issue, how can we work together on to make sure that it doesn't fall in the wrong hands, but that is a general debate and we, I think, will uh, we'll come to uh, joint conclusions on that. And of course we also discussed the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which is great news because the US will now take that leap step to uh, close the gap on the Paris Agreement. But, uh, we, of course, we are a bit worried about unintended consequences for European companies. The U.S. understands that. We are working together to somehow mitigate uh, those effects. So these were the main talks. But this was one of the talks. But, but, but I just want to deflect it a bit that it is only aiming at one country and that it is just we and the U.S. It is a broader-based debate. But, but, but to its core, of course, uh, it has to do exactly what you were saying about uh, defense technology and, 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 and high-end usage. Thank you so much. Thank you. What are you studying, you said? International economics. But, but all this is... Uh, oh. <laughs> it's also international economics, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so Thanks. much.
Great. Thank you for asking that. I had a whole section on China that I didn't get didn't get to. No, no, um, but students are. One no, of which was semiconductors, yeah. but you asked it with a, um, a much better question than I had, so thank you. Um, we only have time for a couple more questions, so I'm going to... And I will be brief in my answer, so we can take as many questions okay. as possible. Um, it's hard to be so brief on these very weighty topics, but um, we'll do our best. So I'm going to take two questions at a time, um, so if you could be as concise as possible, so we can get through a few more, please. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here, Prime Minister. My name's Tyler. I'm studying finance in the business school here. Uh, my question is, at the end of the Russia-Ukraine war, assuming that some arrangement is able to be reached, how can you reach a solution that balances giving Putin something that he can uh, like, walk away with, but then also maintain Ukraine sovereignty? Yeah, but, but again... Well, well, hold on. Sorry, Thank sorry, you, Tyler. We'll pause yeah, and we'll right. grab Two one questions. from you. Yeah, you're right. I'll be brief. I'm too anxious. <laughs> Hi there, Prime Minister. Thank you for being here. My name's Zach. I'm studying international politics on the SFS. And my question is, piggybacking off the previous question about China, um, what do you see as the Netherlands' future in the Belt and Road Initiative, especially in the wake of the Sino-Russian relationship and the war in Ukraine? Yeah. But on the first question, again, if, if Mexico would, I mean, hypothetically, yeah, so I'm not predicting this, <laughs> but would attack Texas, you still would not like President Biden to think, OK, I need to give something back to Mexico. Uh, so, it, 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 for me, it is difficult to start a debate with that question, but at the, at the same time, I understand the question. It is a good question, because somehow in, in, in let's say, in real politics, in real politics, there has to be something for everybody. But at this stage, where the Russian aggression is, is killing people, and again, this weekend, over 40 people died and still 20, I think, missing in, in the Dnipro, uh, it's so difficult for me to think about Okay, what would we give to Vladimir so that he is a bit less offended? No, uh, he, he needs to stop this. Uh, his government has to be brought to, to accountability. Uh, and, and it can only be Zelensky to take that decision that there is a moment that he can do this. And probably then, later on, your question is a wise question and somehow has to be uh, addressed. Uh, but it's difficult for me now to assess how that will be done. Other than that somehow you have to think about, of course, Russia and our relationship with that country, which is not going away, it's there. And, and by the way, Russia has a huge history and huge culture. It's, it's the country of uh, Prokofiev and Tchaikovsky and, and of uh, Tolstoy and of the great philosophers and the beautiful cities. How can a country like that get this guy in power and then do these awful things uh, to a country with which it has so many ties, which is Ukraine? The, sorry, I'm again too long. And, 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 uh, the Belt and Road. The Belt and Road. Yeah, of course, this is, a, this is a China initiative. In, in generally, I understand what they are doing. They want to have an a, a alternative uh, route into Europe, for example. Um, and, and I don't mind that. I mean, that, that's all perfectly fair. But every country has to assess, case by case, how they want to get involved. And when countries can get a lot of money and loans uh, and then could be, then become more dependent, you really have to think about it. And that's what I like very much about uh, the Biden administration, that uh, this government here is really trying how to build a long-term relationship. For, for example, with Africa, you, you guys hosted 50 African nations for days here in Washington to really invest in that relationship. That's different from just giving money and then saying, now I have power. So, and, and that obviously is something every country who has to assess for themselves. Thank you. Okay, your questions are all way too substantive. We've got one more minute. <laughs> I'll be very brief. Can you be extremely quick? Uh, I will. <laughs> Thank um, you. My name's Dawa. I work for the EU delegation. It's, it's an honor to see my own prime minister here in the Netherlands. Yeah, in, in good the to US. see you. <laughs> and which, you're working for or studying? Is, I'm, uh, I'm a trainee at the EU delegation here. Ah, okay, fantastic. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so here's the ambassador. <laughs> is he <Exactly>. good? <laughs> And is the ambassador okay? Yeah. Okay, great. He's okay. He's okay. Great. <laughs> um, the Mutual Admiration Society. No, no, please. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, as I work for the EU delegation, how you have experienced the coordination within the EU in response to the, the crisis in Ukraine. Of course, there have been many statements uh, by uh, leading members in the EU, but how has the actual practical coordination went in your experience? Uh, since the start of the EU. Well, I, I must say uh, incredibly well. Uh, and the EU can be very slow. Uh, uh, of course, the EU is the, is the most powerful internal market in world history. That is the big success. And there has not been war between France and Germany because of what the, the precursor of the EU were trying to achieve. And then the EU 
uh, starting itself, I think, in the early 90s as a follow-up of that. So it has been incredibly successful. Um, it is an organization, it is not a country. Uh, all, we, have, we have sovereign member states. Um, but on COVID-19, but also now on, on Russian aggression against Ukraine, I really think that the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, and, uh, and others are really trying to coordinate uh, as best as possible. Not easy, because you have Berlin and Paris, and of course these, these, these strong capitals want their own role, and sometimes even the Hague wants to play a role. Uh, so it is always a bit uh, trying to balance everything, but I think uh, we have been able, and also thanks to NATO. NATO has been incredibly important here. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, unfortunately, we are at time. Yeah, sorry to <sighs> sorry. those of you. Um, thank you for those excellent questions. I think uh, the Georgetown students are quickly going to put us journalists in DC out of jobs. Exactly. Um, so thank you to everybody who joined us in person today and those of you who are joining online. Um, I've been asked if those of you who are in the room can just wait a minute, um, stay in your seats whilst uh, to give the Prime Minister a few minutes to take a photograph with the, the Dutch students here and then if they um, want to. he'll get on his way yeah. to his busy schedule. Don't feel schedule. pressured. Yeah. Um, and thank you to our host, the Atlantic Council and the Georgetown yeah, School again, of Foreign Service. And thank you all. Eh? I mean, sorry for not asking all the questions. <laughs> Great.